All right. Well, we're going to move on to our data elements um, for the next version. Version 7, um, this is data starting uh, for discharges July 1st, 2017 and after. So we're very fortunate today to have both of our consulting cardiologists here. Um, Dr. Steinle, who's been with our program for over 20 years. Um, what's the state of it? He's got a nice uh, little resume here. And he said he looked at this today and decided he was getting old. Um, <laughs> we have just been so fortunate to have him be part of this program since before it was even a mandatory program. And um, this is going to be his last big um, event with OSHBID, his last training. So um, we want to just thank him one more time. We did a, a nice uh, thank you for him um, at our auditor training last fall. But um, I'm sure we'll still hear from him and he'll be around and probably show up at our CAP meetings and um, email us when there's stuff in the newspaper and stuff like that. But um, he will be presenting today. For the last year, um, we've been fortunate also to have Dr. Matchison involved and kind of, I say being an apprentice, I don't think that's really the, the right word, but um, He's going to be taking over the lead as our consulting cardiologist um, after this, and I do say, I want to say he is from the Ohio State University undergrad, no, MD from there, yes, yep. um, and um, you can read all about him here too, I won't go through all of it, but we're really fortunate to have him, and it's nice to have an interventionalist um, around, and yes, Robert? So I will turn it over to Dr. Steinle now. Um, well, I should start. Um, so I hope you're applauding by the end because it's going to be a long day. I have to say, when we go through all of the variables, which is it's a lot of variables and they're a little bit tedious. So, um, but um, uh, we'll we'll uh, try to make do. I, I guess I should start by saying, you know, the, the, I have a great respect uh, for surgeons. One of the things as a, a cardiologist is at cocktail parties, you get to explain to people that you don't do heart surgery because they invariably think you do. And then I just explained that to my patients. They say, are you going to do my surgery? And I say, you know, fortunately for you, I'm not going to because I always tell the story of when I was a fellow, there was a surgeon who was brilliant for his research, but they always said that if the cardiac surgery fellow wasn't in the room to save the patient from his really clumsy hands, you know, it would be a terrible thing. Um, but I uh, one day was putting a patient on fem fem bypass in the CVICU, and this surgeon wandered around. and. I did the right side and he did the left side and he was considered the surgeon in our group that had the worst hands and he sewed about 10 times as well as I did in terms of sewing in this big um, hose we were putting into the femoral artery. So I realized I was a lot worse than the worst surgeon uh, in, in, in our group. And so these guys take patients who are 70 years old, stop their heart or more impressively don't stop their heart. It, it uh, puts, um, uh, you know, microscopes on their glasses, reach into a small hole, often with uh, instruments that are, you know, really long because it's a difficult exposure, operate on something the size of your fist, um, and 98% of the patient times the patient survives, and most of the time without another major complication, which is really, really very impressive. And as a reward for that, they get paid well, which is good, but we also scrutinize the heck out of them and report their name in the, in the, uh, the newspaper when they have, like if you get one or two deaths, that makes you look bad. Um, and, uh, you know, this is really, I have a great respect for what they do and it's really kind of a tough situation that we, we put them in. And I'm very, very grateful that although it would make perfect sense to grade cardiologists in the same way, that we don't. So, um, <laughs> although if you were king of the universe, you'd actually write that legislation as well, because we really ought to be taking, you know, we really ought to be uh, globally um, uh, measuring the quality of all uh, coronary care, you know, intervention, et cetera. Although intervention is gradually getting into the publicly reporting uh, realm as well. Well, so why do we do this? I will say that um, uh, mortality is not the only measure of quality, it's just actually kind of a proxy. Why do we do bypass surgery? We want to relieve angina and make people live um, longer. That's not measured by operative mortality, and in fact, doesn't necessarily have to go hand in hand. Um, but I will say that um, this whole science goes back to 
uh, actually uh, a famous uh, report of pediatric surgery in the UK where there were about 10 or 12 hospitals doing pediatric surgery, heart surgery, and the average mortality I think was like, might have been 8% because these are pretty high rate surgeries. But one of the hospitals had like a 25% uh, mortality. And nobody knew that until they measured it. They had been going on for years. In, in fact, I think it was actually sort of a whistleblower who said, gee, it seems like a lot of patients are, are dying here, these are kids. And then they looked at it, and of course the hospital said, well, our, pa our patients are sicker. That turned out not to be the case. And, you know, this led to a change that was really just very much an outlier. We had, you know, fortunately, I think from the start of this uh, process, only a few outliers that I can remember. But, you know, that's part of the reason we do this. The other thing is what uh, uh, Holly alluded to is that um, when people focus on quality, even if it's just mortality, there's a lot of, you know, knock-on benefits to that, things they pay attention to um, that may be unrelated, actually, to stuff we're measuring that leads to an improvement in quality. They start paying more attention to infection control, early excavation, early ambulation. We now ambulate patients even when they're still vented, amazingly enough, and, you know, all sorts of things. The early experience with measuring uh, mortality for bypass surgery in the Northeast, there were only, like, 10 hospitals. But I'm thinking this was... Uh, actually the, north, the northeast of the collective, so like 10 hospitals that did bypass surgery, well, some of them have mortality that was twice as high as others. So they actually went and watched surgeries at the places that had better outcomes, and they realized there were different ways that people communicated in the, in the OR. So there are lots of things that we don't measure that um, are hopefully improvements that come along with this. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Um, the the uh, other thing is, so why do we do, um, you know, why do we do this training and so forth? Well, and what is the, um, uh, and now I'm going to discuss some general principles that we try to apply to clarifying the definitions of these risk factors. Um, you know, the first thing is that the risk of dying from a surgery is mostly not the surgeon or even the entire hospital and team. It's actually mostly the patient. When you measure it, it's like, you know, 70 or 80 percent patient characteristics and, and, you know, less than 20 percent probably care. And the care is not just the surgeon, it's actually the uh, CD anesthesiologist, the CD intensivist, the ICU nurse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, when I first started to do this, I was reading all the definitions of the variables that captured that patient risk, and I, I was told I was basically going to have to write the definitions. This is kind of what I was, you know, I thought I was hired to do. And then um, the surgery panel that we had convened initially said, you know, the STS already does this. You should absolutely use their definitions. I said, great, I'm going to have more time for my research because this has all been taken care of uh, uh, for me until I sat down and read the STS definition <laughs> and didn't understand a lot of them. So I actually came up here to Sacramento because there was a, the biggest hospital in the state from the bypass at the time had a, a one surgery group, and they had three nurses who were abstracting this data. who have been doing it for years, so I went to their office. They all shared a room, they shared an office, three desks kind of crammed together in one office. And I said, I, you know, I've got some questions for you. I just, you know, want to ask you a few questions about how you code these variables, these variables. And so let's ask you about this one. And the first one said, oh, I code it this way. And the second one looked, looked at her and said, I don't code it that way. And the third one said, well, I don't code it that way, uh, the way the second person said. And they all three of them coded this, this particular variable differently. To which I said, okay, Houston, we have a problem here uh, because that's not, it's not good if we're not coding these the same way. Um, over the years, we've, you know, you're going to see me um, thinking out loud as we go through these. Um, so we, we, we do some, um, uh, I, I try to apply some principles. So the first thing is um, we, um, we want to capture risk. We want to capture preoperative risk. So, you know, we try to do what we think captures preoperative risk. Sometimes we have evidence for what captures risk, other times we don't. But we try to make a guess as to what, what is actually going to capture risk. So an example there is often the STS will say something about, well, if you have ventricular tachycardia and you give lidocaine for it, i.e. you treat it, it counts as ventricular tachycardia. But the same ventricular tachycardia, if you don't treat it, doesn't count as ventricular tachycardia. That doesn't make any sense in terms of what predicts risk. So we've always pretty much ignored where they said, we, we're trying to look at the physiology of the patient, not what, how it was responding to, because that's very arbitrary. And then another example that they've since gotten rid of is it used to be you didn't have unstable angina unless you gave IV nitroglycerin. Why did that make the patient any sicker? That's a long time ago. Um, so we try to capture risk. The other thing is 
we're trying to do something that um, people can actually code. And so sometimes I'll read an ambiguous definition, and, I'm, I, and I go, well, I could, we, could, we could say that we're going to code it this way, or we could say that we're going to code it this way. And um, I'll ask, and I'll find out that 90% of people are coding it this way, and we'll choose that the way that 90% of people are doing it for two reasons. One is that's going to be, you know, there's a reason why people have chosen to code that way, but also every time I've tried not to do that, it's been a failure. It's like trying to tell your teenager to do something. They will not do it necessarily. So if everybody's coding a variable one way, it's very difficult to change those practices. Um, and very often the reason people do that is it makes sense. And similarly, sometimes I think, oh, well, this is what the STS means. I'm pretty sure I'm right. I'll say that, and then people will tell me, well, we don't code it that way, and I'll discover that they don't code it the way that the SDS wrote, wrote it. And in those cases, we will sometimes say, okay, well, let's all try to be consistent and code it that way. Um, the other principle we try to do is um, we try to uh, uh, code in a way that we think is consistent, that, that, is, that can be done consistently. Um, if we make a, a definition too complicated or too nuanced, it's um, it's hard for people to code it consistently. Um, the way the variable that I failed miserably in this regard was the, my clarification for cardiogenic shock, which is those of you who've read it, extremely complicated, and I set out to make it simple. Interestingly enough, it's one of the ones I've gotten the most positive feedback on, um, in that people say they, you know, they, they use it. It, it. There are many different ways you could have written it, but it, it talks about level of support and so forth. And what I found is people who actually read the definition and code and abstracted this variable, all we're doing, making these decisions, put it in some way or another, somewhat similar to what I wrote down, but they're all doing it slightly differently. There's just a lot of decisions you have to make in, in coding that and abstracting that variable. Um, and that brings me to maybe to another point, which is there's no way to remove clinical judgment from this process. And the good news is, over the years, I found that those of you who do the abstraction have come, come you know, many of you come with years and years and years of experience of both abstracting but also clinical experience. And so you bring clinical experience to this um, and a great deal of knowledge. In fact, I always learn a lot from um, talking to you all, so by all means, ask questions along the way. Um, but, you know, in advance, there are many examples of where you have to apply clinical judgment, but I'll get asked some question where, you know, there'll be some synonym for a diagnosis that we forgot to think about. We didn't, and, the, you know, the, um, the, the abstractor will say, well, they said the patient had cardiac insufficiency, they said they had a long LASIK, they had rattles, blah, blah. I know they had heart failure, but they never said they had heart failure. Um, and, you know, it won't meet our technical definition because we say you have to have a, some sort of synonym for heart failure. We didn't mention the one that the clinician happened to use. And, but the person says, I know they had heart failure. Um, or vice versa, they'll say, I know this person didn't have this diagnosis, but they, but they said that, um, that's maybe another example. They said in eight different places, you know, they said in the, the uh, past medical history in the ACP that they had this diagnosis. But in reading the chart, it's completely clear to me they didn't have this diagnosis. What should I do? And I'll say, don't code the diagnosis because your clinical judgment is exactly right. Um, uh, I guess another sort of example that the SCF actually does clarify is for cardiogenic shock, uh, they actually, they used to say a blood pressure less than 80 to 90. Uh, and this gives you an example where the SCF sometimes drives me crazy. Well, when they say it, it, the blood pressure is less than 80 to 90, which is it, 80 or 90, right? And you can't, you can't say that. You have to pick a, pick a number if you're going to operationalize the definition. Um, now they say 90. Was that what I would have chosen? Probably not. I would have chosen 80, to be honest. But because the, the intent of that variable is clearly that it's not just any cardiogenic shock, it's, it's clearly that it's fairly advanced cardiogenic shock, right? It's, it's mild shock is not supposed to count. Um, is there anybody who walks around who's, who's perfectly well, who doesn't even have a heart problem, who walks around with a blood pressure less than 90? Yeah, there are lots of people, not lots of people, but there are quite a few people who, you know, particularly younger people who have blood pressures less than 90. Do they have cardiogenic shock? No, they don't have cardiogenic shock. They chose a cardiac index of less than 2.2. Are there people who, who, especially since this is not an accurately measured uh, variable necessarily, who have a cardiac index of 2.1 who are not in cardiogenic shock? Yes, there are. So the SCS actually says if the person doesn't have a syndrome that goes along with cardiogenic shock, they just meet one of the numerical cutoffs, 
they don't have cardiogenic shock, don't code it. The STF has a statement to that effect. And that's the kind of clinical judgment you need to exercise in order to do this as well as, as, as is possible. So, um, and so then uh, with all of that said, um, the other thing that has changed over the years is where you get your information. We've gone to electronic medical records during the 20 some odd years I've been doing this. That changes everything in terms of what uh, information is available to you. Um, uh, but a couple of other principles um, that we apply. In general, you should not be making a diagnosis that was not made by people taking care of the patient. There are, there, there are some exceptions. The ones that pop to mind is hemoglobin A1C. Now, usually somebody, the vast majority of times, the hemoglobin A1C is elevated. Somebody will also write diabetes in the chart. But every once in a while, that gets checked in the hospital, and, you know, nobody writes diabetes. Um, uh, preoperatively, but you know that's such a reliable blood test that conveys three months of sugars beforehand. That you know that the uh, it's a, you know the FTF says you can make that that, that diagnosis yourself. Um, but in the vast majority of situations, um, if you try to make a diagnosis that wasn't made by the clinicians, it's, 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 there are pitfalls with that. So we will say you should in general not be doing that. Um, and then um, what else are we going to say? Uh, but, but sometimes the, the clinician will make a diagnosis, and the STS has always asked that you confirm that diagnosis. One of the classic examples would be lung disease. And I remember talking to the STS about this from the beginning, and that's because they realized that the term COPD or lung disease was thrown around very loosely. Or they want, you know, like for instance, shock is another example. You'll see the word shock in a lot of charts of patients who don't meet the definition. That happens all the time because we use it clinically almost as a short term to mean the patient was sick or unstable. Even if they weren't in shock all the time, you know, they dipped their blood pressure in response to nitroglycerin, but now the blood pressure is 140 over 90 after off of meds. And, and you may, people might say the patient was shocking. That just meant they were unstable or, 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 or sick. So similarly, we throw around diagnoses where you have to confirm the diagnosis, but you shouldn't make them very often if that makes sense. The other thing is this will be like the, you know, I don't know how many, I guess I've been through all seven versions of, our, of the C core definitions and you'll see me mix them up in my mind and so a little bit because that does unfortunately happen. The other thing is um, in some cases, uh, and this is a particular thing we were talking to Hans about beforehand, um, how many of you have noticed uh, uh, the three different ways you can time the beginning of a bypass surgery? So, uh, so couple, couple, two other principles. One is we're trying to get preoperative risk, right? So if something happens in the OR, that's, that's, that, that's not a risk factor. That's actually a, a response to the care the patient's receiving. We want to measure the outcome of that care, so we're not going to count that as a risk factor. If they, if they have an arrest after the surgery has started, that doesn't count as a risk factor. That's something that, you know, the surgeon did to the, to the patient. So, you know, we need to know when the surgery started. And there are three different ways that you can, you can count the start of a surgery. And sometimes the STS didn't specify that. And so then when we were asked, we specified it. And now more recently, the STS has started to be better about specifying what they mean as the start of the procedure. And they don't always specify the exact thing we specify. And on occasion, we have missed that there's a discrepancy. So whenever you see that, ask us about it, because in the vast majority of cases, in fact, I think every case, we didn't intend there to be a difference. But usually it's just arbitrary. Um, and the three times, just so you know, are when they enter the OR, induction of anesthesia, or the incision. And why they pick one in certain cases versus another is, a, is sometimes a mystery to me. Um, and then, um, Another principle is that the risk factors don't all convey, is the risk factors are the risk factors, but they don't necessarily, um, they're not global assessments of risk. And an example I use of this is, uh, as a 55-year-old man with sort of no prior cardiac history, if I came in with a non-STEMI, was found to have surgical anatomy, and continued to have chest pain, and they took me to the, emergency, they took me to the OR, you know, uh, urgently, I could actually be, uh, uh, either an urgent or even an emergent surgery if I was actually still having chest pain and they had to take me within a few hours. But I would be much lower risk than an 80-year-old having his, his third redo who was elective. 
So you can have an elective patient who's higher risk than, than the, uh, 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 an, an urgent patient who doesn't have any other risk factors. So you'll see patients with the same risk factor where it's their low-risk version of that or high-risk version of it, you still just need to code the, because it's a global, you know, totality of the risk factors that try to get at the risk. Does that make sense? And then also, you know, there are some patients where their risk is really not captured perfectly by the, um, by the risk factors, and the surgeons are always very concerned about that, but, you know, hopefully over time that comes out in the wash. And I will say, people, the surgeons in particular, are very worried if they have a, a bad year. But what I've seen is that consumers and uh, patients are actually, they understand this. Their interpretation of these results is far more sophisticated than we might have feared. They don't overreact to, you know, uh, single, single bad years. So with those things in, um, in, uh, as background, we'll, we'll move on here. And so, the, you know, the, in general, you want to go for the official, these are all the sources of information. That's going to vary from, uh, from hospital to hospital a little bit. And you can only know what's in, in the chart. You don't, you're not expected to go back, you know, uh, 25 years, although with electronic medical records, your ability to go back and confirm things is better. Um, and so you do the best you can. And if you find that stuff is not being included in the charts, that's a great conversation to have with your clinician to say, um, to say hey, could you document this? Could you, make, could you get that documentation in the chart? Um, another thing, I guess our one last point to make is, um, you'll often be told by a clinician, oh, this patient, you should code this because they have, they had this. And then you'll, you'll know that they didn't meet the definition. That's another conversation you need to have with the clinician because they feel very strongly sometimes. Remember I mentioned a bit about Shockey? That's one of the ones that comes up all the time. Well, the doctor really said the patient was Shockey. We look at it and that patient doesn't meet any definition of shock, really. And it's just to that, to that clinician, the patient felt sick. And, and that's, so they're saying they're shocky, but they don't, so you need to educate them on the definition. The way we use terms clinically is not always the way that the SGFs intend us to. Okay, so um, you uh, want to look for preoperative risk factors. You want to look for an official report. Often there'll be a CAS report that says there was a 90% stenosis or 70% stenosis, and somebody else will have written a note saying, I looked at it and I said this. In general, when, those, when you get disagreements about um, a, a report, you're going to go with the official report. I say that because the official report is often written by a cardiologist, and it's often the surgeon who wrote the note commenting on it, and so we're going to go with the cardiologist because I'm a cardiologist. Um, uh, but no, in all seriousness, we need to pick one, and the more, the formal report is the one we use. Um, uh, and these are the sources of information. Um, confirm but do not um, make diagnoses rely on official reports. Um, these are the, I actually think I've talked about pretty much all of those points um, already, um, uh, which is that you're going to, uh, we're looking to predict risk, allow consistent coding, uh, uh, try to clarify contra contradictions. We're not trying to change the variables virtually never, ever. We're just trying to, to uh, uh, the ones that are ambiguous, we're trying to clarify. Uh, these got to be preoperative, not intraoperative risk. And then th despite everything we do, you're going to come up with something, some situation we've not thought of, and you're just going to have to make your best call. And the good news is folks who do this work, in my experience, are well-equipped well, uh, to do that. Um, okay, so these are the ones, the things that um, are straightforward enough that, in general, we don't, um, they're either straightforward enough or they're not actually risk factors or we don't, we don't really cover them. Um, and the, uh, the one that is correctly not in there is probably, is gender in there? Nope, gender is not in there because that's one that we usually comment on and, and uh, the gender uh, is gender at birth um, and uh, that's actually sex, uh, sex, sex there, oh sex is there, okay, so sex. Yeah, so se and so sex is actually the correct term actually for gender anyway, so, so sex. Now, it turns out sex at birth, by the way, is not as simple as what I just said because that's actually uh, so you would, the correct term would be to say assigned sex at birth, because sometimes sex at birth is not straightforward. But if, so in other words, if you have a trans, and this is this is our best stab at it. Um, I, uh, and uh, my my medical center is actually a transgender uh, referral center, uh, and it turns out my wife is an endocrinologist who also uh, does transgender care as a kind of a specialty, um, and. Um, the, the note, so if, you're, if, you're, if, we, if we have a trans woman who's being operated on, 
we're going to treat, we think their risk is the same as a man and, and vice versa. It isn't going to be exactly the same if they've received um, hormonal treatment and depending on how long and so forth, but that's, that's been, uh, that's what the, the, you know, that's how we, how we handle it. So you would treat a trans woman as, uh, as a, uh, having him uh, uh, be male sex and you would treat a trans man as, as um, having female sex. Um, because so, for instance, women um, are at higher risk, it turns out, and we think that's because they're smaller, um, say for bypass surgery. And so that's our best, our best interpretation of that, but um, uh, that's not necessarily as straightforward as the fact that it's not covered in the training, if that makes sense. All right. Um, okay. Um, so one of the first things you have to determine is, is this going to be a reportable procedure? Was it isolated or not? And um, there's a whole list of things that make you not isolated. And every year, uh, actually every couple of months, we, we have a new one. Or there's kind of a, um, a different gradation of a procedure we've talked about before. So um, there are many, many examples of these. But in general, um, uh, the principle I apply when trying to decide whether it's something that's going to exclude a case or not, or do I think the add-on procedure um, was increased the risk or not? Right, so if it's something really minor that we don't think had any bearing on the risk of the procedure, we'll usually count that as isolated. Um, do I, if it was a, in response to a complication that occurred during the surgery, that's still not, that's still isolated, that's not an exclusion because that's actually part of the care we're trying to measure. If it's something that was a choice, that was an option, a, a, a way to do the bypass surgery, rather than something that needed to be done because of the physiology of the patient, then we will usually count that as isolated. So every once in a while, somebody will say, well, you know what, the piece of aorta I was going to plug the bypass graft into is a little bit, you know, um, junky. So I'm going to go and put a little patch on that part of the aorta and then plug the graft in, or they're going to do an endarterectomy of the coronary artery that they plugged the graft into. Those are choices that usually you, there, you, know, you could do it or you couldn't do it. That's part of the care we want to measure. That's different than, say, if you have an aortic aneurysm that's six and a half centimeters and the surgeon has to repair it at the same time that they're doing the bypass surgery. That's treating the physiology. That's excluded, but the little patch repair is not. Similarly, if you're fixing an aneurysm in a, uh, if you're doing a, a carotid endarterectomy, we don't do this anymore very often, but if we're doing a carotid endarterectomy at the time of bypass surgery, we exclude those, unlike a coronary endarterectomy where we're plugging in the graft. Does that make sense? So some of these things are just options about the way to do the surgery, and, um, and we, that's what we want to measure. Uh, other things are, um, are actually something that was unique to the patient that required an additional treatment that increased the risk. And uh, if, I, if I made that sound straightforward, black and white, it's not in many gray cases. So you, if you get those, ask us about it. Because um, I remember the first time we dealt with a case of somebody had their toe amputated, and we decided to uh, exclude that case. And I, I had this fear that surgeons we're going to start amputating toes to get patients excluded, but the, you know, we, we decided that was never going to happen, so we weren't worried about it. So, all right, so these are lists of things that, um, uh, uh, so ventriculectomy, uh, yeah, this is another example. So if they go in to do a, a cardiac remodeling procedure preoperatively because the patient has a cardiac aneurysm, a LV aneurysm, that's excluded. But every once in a while we read cases where they went in and there was, like, they, there was an infarct and they were oozing and they put a patch on it and they'll use the same word. They'll say, we did a, you know, we did a ventricular repair and that's not excluded. So um, <clears throat> that's a principle that applies as well. If the diagnosis was recognized before the surgery and the procedure was planned before the surgery, some of those will be excluded, whereas if it was recognized in the operating room, you should start to question whether it should be excluded. Probably the best example of that is pericardiectomy. Um, almost many bypass surgeries involve, especially redos, they'll have to strip off a little bit of pericardium and, you know, they'll get some scar tissue. Um, and then that's different than constrictive pericarditis where they do a full pericardial stri uh, stripping. The, the, the uh, uh, full pericardial stri stri stripping is excluded and is a very high risk procedure, but removing a little bit of the pericardium 
um, during the surgery, if it's a redo, um, definitely increases the risk. That risk factor is captured in the fact that it's a redo, but we're not going to exclude the case because that's usually an option. And frankly, it's very difficult for us to know how much of the pericardium was removed and was this just, you know, sort of an incidental add-on uh, or was this really a big deal? You know, that probably means there are a few patients that where we don't appropriately capture the risk, but um, since pericardiectomy gets listed on a lot of what are essentially isolated surgeries, that's an example of the kind of thing. So the principle of if it wasn't recognized beforehand, you should question whether it's an exclusion. Does that make sense? There may be some examples where it is an exclusion, so um, I'll give you an example. Sometimes we don't diagnose, uh, uh, it's never the cardiologist's fault, but sometimes the cardiologist doesn't diagnose the dissection before the surgery. We send the patient, we tap them, and amazingly we don't make the diagnosis then, and then we send them for bypass surgery maybe urgently, and the surgeon says, you know what, there's a type A dissection here, and they have to repair it. That's an exclusion because uh, Presumably that wasn't caught. Now, presumably that wasn't caused by the surgeon. Uh, although the, Dr. Matheson is, we've seen cases where it appeared it was caused by the surgeon, in which case it wouldn't be excluded. But if, it, if it, you know, if the history is, oh, they go in and they find there's a mild aneurysm, and that aneurysm has dissected, and that's what caused the inferior infarct, and we just didn't make the diagnosis before the operating room. Which has anybody seen that happen? Because I have, and that's excluded. So because that was a but that's kind of an exception. It's just we missed the diagnosis that we had good reason to believe was there beforehand. And then the rest of them, I'm not going to read through them. You can read, you can read it when you come up with a procedure. You can see if we've listed it. Um, but basically, there are, there are a lot of them. And the ones that I think are, you know, I sometimes have wondered when they've done, like, subclavian repairs. We exclude those. Uh, if it's in a, you know, like, those don't happen very often. But occasionally, there's a significant aneurysm. In a, in like in a chest vessel. I really wonder how much it increases the risk, but we exclude those in general. What we don't tend to exclude is if there's a minor, uh, the most common repair we don't exclude is if there's a task that was done that led to a relative need for, you know, sort of a repair of something that was done by the cardiologist. Usually those aren't major enough, nor do they represent the physiology of the patient to be excluded. So, all right, does that all make sense? All right, we'll keep going. And I'm just going to read through these and make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, these are things that um, are excluded, and most of them are pretty obvious. Generally, if you repair a hole in the heart, endarterectomy of the aorta, not endarterectomy of a coronary, uh, again, not stuff that was caused by the surgery itself that needs to be repaired. Those are responses to complications. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there, there are a couple of situations where we get into, unfortunately, um, kind of gradations. So um, the one that I haven't had much trouble with is like resection of lung. So stapling of bleb, which happens sometimes, or biopsy and just a lesion in the lung, that's not an exclusion. But we, but we had to basically ask our question, you know, we had people who were removing very small parts of lung as really a biopsy. And then we had people who were getting their lung resected at the time of the bypass surgery. And there's a big, you know, a pneumonectomy or a lobectomy. We basically decided to make the cutoff at the lobe. If they, if they do a lobectomy, that's excluded. If they just do something less than a lobectomy, which is usually some sort of biopsy rather than a treatment, that's not excluded. And mastectomy, we excluded. Uh, occasionally, we've had breast masters that were biopsied in the operating room. That's not excluded. So. And then we'll get, I think we're, mazes is the other one that, um, uh, there's a definition of a full open maze, which is a little bit like the Holy Roman Empire. It's not Holy Roman or an empire and you don't know how to define it, but a full open maze is, um, we don't consider it an exclusion for a mitral valve surgery. Um, so I'm going to talk first about mitral valve surgery. Mitral valve surgery, mazes are not exclusions. The reason is you're in the atrium anyway, and um, we feel like a maze is almost part, potentially just part of a mitral valve surgery. Now that we do valves, we've made that distinction. But for non-mitral valve surgeries, there are all sorts of flavors of maze, right? I mean, a bunch of different ways to do it, some of which are pretty minor. And so we, for a while, we've gone back and forth on this, but on the advice of our surgeons, 
Uh, and I would have done it differently. I just would have included them all personally because it's, it's too hard to make the distinction. But our surgeon said, well, the really big mazes should still be excluded. So we, just, we came up with this phrase, a full open maze, by which we mean the left atrium was opened up and stuff was done on the inside of the left atrium. If the left atrium is not opened up and they're just making burns on the outside or even cuts on the outside, we, we don't count that. Now, um, a left atrial append, appendage ectomy, which I guess could be considered opening up the left atrium, that doesn't count. That, that wouldn't be isolated. But if they, sometimes I've seen this, they open up the left atrial appendage and then they go in through the left atrial appendage, I think, through that incision and start making stuff on the inside of the left atrium, that would count as a full open maze. None of these, these days they don't do what they did when the maze procedure was invented, which is use a scalpel to make all these things. Usually they put a catheter in there of some kind and make burns, just like a catheter maze. But nonetheless, if they're doing a significant amount of stuff on the inside of the left atrium, having cut open the left atrium for a non microsurgery, those are excluded. For the microsurgeries, we said, well, you're there anyway, and it's kind of part of the surgery, so it's not excluded. So how complicated is that? Kind of a little complicated. And let's see, cabbage plus valves, these are the things that would, um, that would be included in the valves, and I guess the points here are that we're saying mitral and aortic valves, those are the kind of valves we, we, we report, and it includes replacement or repair but for the aortic valves, if they've, if they've done something significant to the root, i.e. replace the root, that's, that's an exclusion. Okay, there's, and we've got some, you get into the weeds a little bit on that, but um, yes, yeah, so. And for aortic valves, there are occasionally, I think the notion of an aortic valve repair is coming back a little bit, um, but those are still relatively uncommon. But mitral valve replacement and repair are the same. And then, um, since we're talking about valves, when we're talking about has the patient had a prior, we're not measuring TAVRs. TAVRs are not part of what we're measuring here. However, there's a risk factor of have they had a previous valve, and that does include percutaneous valves, which are going to be a big deal, and probably, well, essentially, percutaneous valve uh, data is being reported, being reported to Medicare as part of the billing process, so there is a, a very vigorous just to reassure you, there's quite a robust quality process when it comes to TAVR. It just is not through the state of California. Okay, exclusions for cabbage plus valve. So we don't do pulmonic and tricuspid. I think most of these other things we've talked about, um, which are um, these fairly major surgeries on other vessels, uh, pulmonary endarterectomies, which usually don't go along with bypass surgeries, but are very risky, big surgeries really done, I think, primarily at one hospital in this state, and uh, uh, th that's not included. And, yeah, I don't, th I've not been asked this question. Uh, this is one where um, one could, sometimes these fistula repairs, anyway, con congenital coronary artery fistulas we exclude. That one I think is a, is a borderline call, but that's what we've done. And then, um, I haven't seen this in a while, but there, um, early on, you know, there, we talked about uh, uh, ephemeral bypass, by which we mean we're bypassing the femoral artery because of peripheral vascular disease. And there were some people who got confused between that and what's called fem-fem bypass, which is a way to put some, somebody on the heart-lung machine. Mm -hmm. They're two different things, they just happen to have similar words. So, um, so just be aware of that, but um, I haven't heard anybody be confused by that in a while. Okay, we talked about the lungs already. Let's see, I'm sorry, I don't go too fast. Full open maze I talked about. Um, the rest of these, pretty much I've talked about. These are all exclusions. Does not include uh, uh, lymph node. Yep, that's stuff I said. Date of discharge. Um, which is, um, let's see, the only time I've been asked about this is in, in cases of people who ended up becoming, there were brain death cases. Um, there, there, there were some, uh, it is possible to have your date of death be before your date of discharge if you, um, or if you're brain dead, that's come up a couple of times. Otherwise, I don't know that I've been asked about this. 
um, recently, and we talked about the definition, the definition of mortality has changed to include mortality after discharge to another facility. And okay, and they, if they change, if they leave an acute care facility to go to a facility that happens to be in the same building but isn't an acute care hospital, that's counted as a discharge. That's what that says there. All right, sounds like that's not confusing. Uh, uh, in the words of Schrodinger and his cat, so were they alive and dead, at the, dead alive or dead at the time of discharge from the hospital? Uh, and I think this is so died in hospital, discharged alive, last known status alive, discharged alive, but died after discharge. Um, you don't always know this information, but we're just collecting that information in case you do know it. It allows us to sort of do. When we're looking to see if somebody died at, another, to a, at a facility that they're transferred to, sometimes you know that and it helps us figure that out. Um, when they were declared dead, and this is brain, if, they, if it's brain dead, um, that's when they're declared dead. Okay, this, this actually is not always straightforward. The responsible surgeon, there, you know, by law, there are two surgeons in the room, and one of them is a responsible surgeon and one of them you know, isn't. And, um, um, anyway, the, uh, the, the answer is, uh, if it's not obvious and you have, to make it, you have to make a call, it's whoever billed for it, whoever collected the fee. That's not, you know, but this is occasionally not, um, not completely straightforward. Um, also, it's helpful to know who the surgeons are in your hospital, um, which, because uh, we've seen occasionally, you know, anesthesiologists or, you know, somebody who wasn't even a surgeon but was in the operating room by, you know, by mistake gets, uh, listed as the co as the surgeon. Um, okay, that's the license number. There we go. They say look it up. Um, I haven't seen this be a problem, at least I'm not asked about it, so it must be that Holly's asked about this. Um, okay, diabetes. So this is one we mentioned already, and. Um, this is the one that violates the make the diagnosis rule, although I have to say if the hemoglobin A1C is elevated, I bet the majority of the time somebody then says the patient has diabetes, but sometimes we don't, you know, we don't do that. Um, is coming in and having high blood sugars and getting insulin in the hospital, does that mean you have diabetes? Not necessarily, right? Stress can make your sugars go up and we treat that sometimes with insulin. Sometimes it means they have undiagnosed diabetes, but other times it means this is just a response to the acute situation. So the hemoglobin A1C um, is one that you can make the diagnosis, but in general, otherwise you, you, you shouldn't make the diagnosis. That doesn't prevent the STS from listing a lot of diagnostic criteria, which they also do for myocardial infarction. And if the myocardial infarction was 20 years ago, you're not going to know that the cardiac enzymes went up by threefold or whatever they list in that very elaborate or whether there were EKG changes. But if somebody said they had a myocardial infarction two years ago, you get to say they had a myocardial infarction. But similarly, they, they'll list a lot of diagnosis, diagnostic criteria that might be useful for the clinicians, but doesn't necessarily mean you should be um, making the diagnosis. So that's the thing that I find a little confusing. The STS does though say that if the hemoglobin A1C is elevated, you can make the diagnosis, but they're not talking about necessarily just randomly elevated sugars, which if the patient's receiving D5 one half, et cetera, there are lots of circumstances where that won't be the case. It turns out, you know, diabetes is not such a crucial risk factor that, it's a, it, that this is a high stakes decision, but it, you know, we try to get it as, as correctly as possible like we do all things. Gestational is not counted. And then we're going to get into, um, and, and, and then I guess I should make the opposite point. If the hemoglobin A1C is 5.6, that means they have, and they're on metformin and they're, they've lost 20 pounds, that's really well controlled diabetes, but that's still diabetes. You don't have to have an elevated hemoglobin A1C. And uh, I mentioned that you can be receiving insulin in the hospital and not have diabetes. And then, uh, so I think I've, yes? Uh, no, diabetes insipidus, while it has the word diabetes in it, um, is a totally different condition that's not meant to, you know, this is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes insipidus is a totally non-insulin related thing that makes you urinate a lot. Um, that's related to a totally different hormone and not meant to be covered by this variable. So the answer to that question is no. 
So uh, it's a little bit like I had a patient just the other day who had an atrial septal aneurysm, incidentally called on the, uh, and uh, the, the patient's husband was a physician colleague of mine who's retired and not this is his specialty, and he was basically worried that his, his, his family member had an aneurysm, and I basically said, this isn't an aneurysm, it's just the word we use. So the, the diabetes and diabetes, these are two different, the, somewhat unrelated conditions that both have the word diabetes in them. Okay. Uh, okay. Good, good question. Dialysis. Uh, just trying to remember if what's confusing about this. Okay. So I think that, um, so basically at the time of the surgery, when they go into surgery, were they on dialysis? And I think that the, uh, and just the two clarifications that I can think of, one is listed in the last bullet point, which is if it's ultrafiltration purely for the removal of fluid, as opposed to the, the creatinine was terrible and they needed to have dialysis that was the full dialysis, we don't count ultrafiltration. Now I'd say ultrafiltration has somewhat fallen out of favor because of negative randomized trials. So probably a lot of people who are receiving you know, things like this, the CVVH, which just means continuous dialysis, they probably would meet, the, they're probably getting it for renal insufficiency rather than fluid removal. How many of your hospitals are still using like ultrafiltration much? Okay, I'm seeing people shake their heads. So a lot of this is probably less of an issue. The only other issue that comes up is they, they got capped and it wasn't the cardiologist's fault. That's a principle, by the way, but we put them into renal failure and they got, uh, Dialyzed, dialyzed like once, and then their kid, and then they, they've gone a week and a half. Their creatinine has fallen from five to you know, et cetera. Are they on dialysis at the time of the surgery? No, I would say not. Um, on the other hand, if they got dialyzed yesterday but they're not hooked up to the machine when they entered the OR, are they on dialysis at the time of the surgery? Yes. So um, you know, that's I think probably pretty obvious, but. If the kidney, if they, if they got dialyzed but it, during this hospitalization, but the, the renal failure has resolved, they're not on dialysis. Uh, hypertension, okay, hypertension, bottom line is it's a very loose diagnosis in that you just have to say, somebody just has to say they have hypertension, but many, all antihypertensive medications are used for other reasons. So if there's no diagnosis of hypertension and they're on antihypertensive medications, they may be on them for other reasons, so don't make the diagnosis. And similarly, um, if, they, if they just have a couple high blood pressures in the, in the hospital, um, you shouldn't make the diagnosis either because that could be, uh, you know, a, a transient thing due to stress. Um, this is probably an example of where um, uh, I believe I can remember being asked about a case where somebody came in and their blood pressure was 200 over 100. They were on hydralazine. They were on like five different antihypertensive medications. But in reading the chart, they were, you know, um, they were not, nowhere did somebody say hypertension, but the, the person reading the chart says, I know they had hypertension, they just left it out of their past medical history. Um, and that was one where I said, okay, go ahead and code it. On the other hand, if you had like two blood pressures of 145 over 90 in somebody who um, uh, had never previously had a diagnosis of hypertension, um, uh, I would say not, don't code it because those um, blood pressures can be spurious in the hospital. So um, there, this is where judgment cannot be removed. And then, on, um, yeah, on the flip side, um, and, um, in general, if somebody has a history of hypertension and they're not on meds, um, at the time, I was still, I was still coded because we don't require that it be, be treated necessarily um, uh, at the time of diagnosis, at the time to, in order to code it. If, if, you know, if they say hypertension a dozen different places, but they happen to have stopped taking their meds before they came into the hospital, so their H&P doesn't list an antihypertensive, you can still code it. Da-da-da, do not code yes based on medications. There we go. That last one would be the, sort of that point. Endocarditis. Okay, so here's an example of where the STS is too much information, I think, in my opinion. So basically, they tell you how to make the diagnosis of endocarditis. 
This is not useful for somebody who's doing abstraction, but um, it's pretty useful for medical residents and cardiology fellows. Um, but really, you're going to need somebody to, to diagnose the endocarditis. Uh, you're not going to make the diagnosis. You're not going to be looking for petechiae and so forth. Um, and so really it comes down to um, does somebody say they have endocarditis? And then the other thing is, is it under active treatment or not, which is probably going to be the, the, yeah, the next thing. And the active treatment is just, are they getting, this is going to mainly apply to valve surgeries, but active treatment means they're on the antibiotics now. That's basically what it comes down to. And this one I have not gotten a lot of questions on, but this is an exact example of where the, they think they, they haven't operationalized the definition. They've given you all this information, which is great, but it's not the concern of the abstractor to be making the diagnosis. Does that make sense? And um, they also make, they do make one point at the bottom here about morantic endocarditis, also called, well, actually, it's also called non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis, and they don't mean that. They mean infectious endocarditis. So, but do you need to be looking for blood cultures and so forth? No, you just need, somebody said they had endocarditis and they were or were not on antibiotics. Okay. And that says what I just said. All right. Uh, code yes, diagnosed, diagnosed. Oh, this is a clarification that the, the STS uh, made, I believe, and, I, and this, is, this is a good point. Occasionally we miss that they had endocarditis and the surgeon goes in. You need to be a little careful because there can be some judgment here. But I believe the case that um, I remember being asked, and I believe this is an STS clarification rather than ours, but I could be wrong about that. But in any event, the scenario is the surgeon goes in for mitral regurgitation or whatever. They find the vegetation. They gram stain it. There are, you know, there are gram negative rods. They culture it. It's positive. We just didn't make the diagnosis before we went in. But, oh, they, do, they did have endocarditis. They found an abscess. They had to, you know, clean out that abscess. That counts as endocarditis. So, so an example of an unrecognized diagnosis, but if you have good reason to believe it was really endocarditis and it was there, we, you know, not caused by the surgery, that would be a one that's recognized in the operating room. And okay, chronic lung disease. Um, so I'd like to skip over this one, but I won't. Um, so this is one where you're meant to both confirm the diagnosis as well as the severity. And unfortunately, the severity um, de depends on, um, to some extent, medication use, which violates my rule about making medications apply, as well as PFTs and, and uh, um, uh, as also as well as uh, blood gas data. And you don't always have this data. That's, that's one of the problems. Uh, an, another problem, well, we'll come to home oxygen because the SCS issued a clarification about home oxygen that wouldn't have been what I would have said, um, and i got to remember, but I believe I, I initially clarified that as severe. I said if the person's on home oxygen, and my, my reasoning was usually to get home oxygen paid for, insurances are pretty strict. You have to meet blood gas criteria, which would put you into the severe category. The SCS just decided, I think it was unknown, as, as, um, but uh, I think that's on the next slide. Um, and then, it, so the only other thing I would say is um, you need to have um, a clinician say they have, there's, there's, there's the word chronic here, which means it's chronic, okay? Now, somebody can have chronic lung disease that was not recognized until they came into the hospital. That's true. But um, what we're a little concerned about is somebody coming in with heart failure, having somebody go ahead and get PFTs while they're in the ICU and in heart failure, have the PFTs not be normal, and then say they have chronic lung disease, or, and then want to code chronic lung disease. So you need to have... Um, you need to have a clinician who says this person has chronic lung disease. I think there needs to be some reason to believe that the PFTs were done in a, in a, situa in a setting where the results were not um, mired by heart failure. Um, and uh, uh, um, so if, if, you know, if you get uh, uh, you know, a PFT that's, that's abnormal, the person has never smoked, they were in heart failure, I would not code that as chronic lung disease. On the flip side, if somebody comes in, and we know hospitals do this because they want to get credit for this risk factor, 
They look at this, you know, somebody with a hundred pack year smoking history who's never gone to the doctor. They do, you know, they sit them up in the uh, step down unit. They're not in heart failure. Their ejection fraction is normal. They do a good set of PFTs. They're pretty crummy. They're hypoxic in the hospital, or whatever. The clinician writes in the chart, this person has COPD. Maybe they even put them on inhalers before the surgery. Who knows? Uh, you can get inhalers before the surgery and not have COPD as well. That's, that would be a legitimate, you know, diagnosis in the hospital before the surgery. But this is where you need to have clinical judgment. Because if they were, you know, into, you know, because, and, and we see a little bit of both. Does that make sense? And that's why we, you know, this is probably one of the areas where the auditors will come in and say, nah, doesn't make it. And then somebody has coded it because, in fact, does that make sense? Okay. Um, And if nobody said anything about it, you shouldn't try to make the diagnosis because you read hyperexpanded, you read a test x-ray report that said, you know, consistent with emphysema. Um, they may or may not have had it, but uh, you need somebody to make the diagnosis. And then um, they, uh, basically they say, uh, I don't know, sometimes they actually won't meet, meet the criteria because, the, the, because of the physiology of asbestosis and mesothelioma. Yes, question from uh, webinar land. Uh, go ahead. Anesthesiologist documented COPD, no yep. other clinician did, and there is no PFT or ABG. The patient had a long standing smoking history. Would I code one of these documented severity unknown? Uh, uh, well, this is a, this is, so I would say that, so the question was, I guess I don't have to repeat it because you said it into the mic, but the question was, an anesthesiologist documented COPD in a patient with a, a, very, a very significant smoking history, and um, would you code number five here, which is to say somebody said they have lung disease, but the severity is unknown, and I believe the intent of number five is yes that you would code that. I'm a little worried about that because if it's the anesthesiologist just before the surgery, I kind of wonder what they based it on. But, um, and if you did, if you had left out the smoking history, I would have said, eh, maybe not. This is where this gets a little, where I make judgment calls when I'm asked questions I haven't heard exactly before. But that said, if you say number five, you're actually gonna get lumped in with, you're not gonna be, it's not going to be much of a risk factor anyway, to be completely honest. That's going to be sort of a non-risk factor. But um, that's, I believe, the intent of what this, of why the STS puts that. But uh, functionally, it's almost like coding no, so I wouldn't sweat these, to be honest. And if you, and if you, if you'd said there was no smoking history, and you know, then I would have said maybe not. So, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, in general, people don't do that. Well-trained clinicians have some reason why they did that. Um, and the whole point of the severity is that the STS recognized that just because somebody had mild COPD or somebody said they had COPD was not a risk factor. And without the severity, it sort of ends up not being a risk factor. Yes? We have doctors who sometimes uh, look at admission ED doctors, look at somebody who smokes and they arbitrarily put COPD on patient as a diagnosis? Well, um, again, I think this is, is what the STS, so the, um, the STS, when we asked the STS about this variable 20 years ago, they explicitly gave that as an example of when they did not want to code chronic lung disease because they knew there were many surgeons who said just a smoking history was chronic lung disease. Um, and I, so I guess my question is, um, if you knew, so let me, let me back up and say, if you knew, like if you knew the anesthesiologist had coded COPD only because of the smoking history, then I would code no. I guess I was giving the anesthesiologist the benefit of the doubt. So if you knew that somebody had, that was their only reason for coding lung disease, I would say no. If, you, if they say they have COPD and you don't know what the basis is, that's where I would use five. Yes. Okay, we've got another one. Yes. Have FED1 of 50% and CHF with history of smoking, so is it COPD? 
Um, I knew I should have skipped this variable. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, FEV1, of, of, uh, well, 50% or less than 50% makes a difference, but in any event, so it's either going to be severe or moderate based on that FEV1. And the question is, um, uh, you're going to use a little bit of clinical judgment here. So if, it, if the person is just been acutely admitted and yesterday they were in pulmonary edema, they're still, you know, as far as you can tell, like fairly much in the acute phase, I would actually treat that, I would disregard that FEV1. On the other hand, if this is five days later, they, you're, they're documenting that they've been diaries 10 liters, they feel a lot better, their neck veins are flat, chest x-ray is clear, they're clearly, they're now out of congestive heart failure, they have that 100 year, pack year history, then I would say, say, I would say yes. Is there a gray zone in between where I can't help you? That's Dr. Matheson's job, and I'm uh, happy he has it. So, no, there's a, there's a talk, yes. It is on that point because it's because of my problem next. Um, so, purely smoking history alone with nothing objective, you're, you're not going to curve that as chronic lung disease. So Correct. That's the only thing. Okay. okay. Correct. Perfect. And I base that off of, they, they, they didn't used to have, see, this is where things have changed. They didn't used to have this five as a choice. So I'm sort of trying to interpret the, the intent of that number five. On the other hand, I'm going back to the days when they explicitly said that's what they were trying to avoid being coded. Yes, another question. Is GERD coded as chronic lung disease? Is GERD coded as chronic lung disease? Okay, so <laughs> no. The answer to that is no. So gastroesophageal reflux disease can actually cause asthma, right? It can cause asthma. But although I didn't mention it, interestingly enough, asthma is excluded. They, they, they say at some point, we don't mean asthma. Now, if you have really bad asthma, it can actually be chronic lung disease that you know, causes structural permanent changes to the lungs if it's, not, if it's been very bad. So, but they mean, what they mean is if you have transient bronchospasm during hay fever, during you know, the pollen season, but the rest of the time your lung function is normal, they don't want you to code that. And GERD can cause asthma, so otherwise, uh, so you're not gonna code GERD as COPD. So. So not all four-letter words are coded as <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions? All right. All right. If I get off this, I, I, I may still get off this diagnosis alive. We'll see. Atelectasis is not coded as COPD. And, oh gosh, another slide, DLCO, da da um, So I think there's nothing there. Bottom line, um, you, somebody needs to say they have chronic lung disease. Then you need to confirm based on something other than heavy smoking, and you need to disregard CO, uh, PFT data that is affected by heart failure or is acute, for which you have good reason to believe is not a reflection of their chronic lung function. Can that be hard? Yes, that's why I'm happy you guys are all pretty smart. So, all right, moving on. Any other questions? Is this easy? No, the data shows how hard this is because we don't get perfect agreement, but all you can do is the best we can do because you all want to be playing on the same, uh, same uh, level playing field. Liver disease. So basically, there's a list of wor words that, and for some reason they don't include NASH, which is uh, non-alcoholic, um, and I always cannot pronounce that, you know, stereo, something or other, hepatopathy, but basically it's like uh, sort of a, um, uh, not included as a significant enough liver disease, but there's a bunch of other things. And I think you wrote portal hypertension down. So portal hypertension generally means you have, if it's, it's virtually always due to liver disease, and that would count. So that's going to tell you that they have liver disease. Um, and, and, and so what would be, and we're now going to talk about the liver function test abnormalities that are going to tell you how sick, the, how severe the liver disease is, and that's actually the important part. So what would be the exception? Cardiac arrest, where the liver function tests go up, go up, that's not liver disease. That's cardiac arrest. So, um, so then you're going to get da, da 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 and then you're going to get into the MELD score, and the MELD score, which I think we covered. Do we cover the MELD score in this? Maybe not. Those are lab values, but basically um, the severity of the liver disease and whether it's a risk factor is going to be determined by some blood tests, um, uh, basically. So. And now there's a, okay, I'm looking at this. There's some, some stuff down here. There is a uh, sort of a gray zone thing. Acute heart failure, 
Actually, you know, really bad right side of the heart failure that's acute can make your LFTs go up, and then if you treat the heart failure, they come back down. Um, however, you can also have something called cardiac cirrhosis, where the chronic presence of right heart failure gives you cirrhosis. So one would count as liver disease, and the other one would be sort of like a cardiac arrest. So these things are not very common, especially in patients who undergo surgery. We hate to operate on people with liver disease. They do very badly. So this ends up not coming up very often because these are the patients we sent to angioplasty. So, because we do not, they don't do well with bypass. All right, and immunocompromised. Um, so it needs to be within 30 days of the procedure. Um, actually, I frankly don't know what the start of the procedure is. If it has to be 29 and a half days, I don't. Maybe they'll they'll say this would be one of those ones where 30 days is a long enough time period. We haven't asked for the is it the incision entering the OR or induction of anesthesia, but what has come up is all the different things that can count as uh, immunosuppression. So there are a whole bunch of drugs other than uh, systemic steroids. So um, inhaled steroids don't count. Inhaled steroids don't count. A gram of solumedrol as part of a preoperative protocol, which I think is, I don't understand exactly where the data for that is, but I hear that that is still being done here and there. There is some, some sepsis. Anyway, that doesn't count. Um, but if they are in chronic steroid therapy, it does count. I think we may get into the dose. Do we get into the dose? I can't remember whether we get into the dose in these slides. But um, so then there are a bunch of other drugs, and this is where judgment um, helps because every year they invent a new drug that we haven't listed. But we we have uh, in our various FAQs and so forth listed a whole bunch of drugs. Basically, they're usually for arthritis or organ transplantation. Um, and those counted, and so it's basically chemo, steroids, and anything for arthritis or organ transplantation, those would be the immunosuppressive drugs that are significant enough to count if they've been receiving it. And then um, the uh, other thing that has come up is what if they have uh, um, uh, HIV-associated disease? And we've, um, in the absence of any other guidance, we basically um, used a, a CD4, uh, which is a, a, you know, blood count, a, blood, a white blood cell count, cut off that's associated with opportunistic infection. So we set a CD4 count less than 200 um, back in the days before we had a highly effective antiretroviral therapy. Um, so if you have HIV disease and a good CD4 count, you're not immunosuppressed. But if you have HIV and your, you know, your, your CD4 count is poor, um, we said that was immunosuppressed. And here's a list of some of the medications. And this is the pre-op stuff. And any questions about that? And I think the thing, I'm trying to remember the clarification about we had people who had received, who were not on steroids now, who had gotten like an asthma treatment, and we, we got into the dose. And I'm going to confess, I'm not remembering where we struck the exact cutoff. Do you remember? I think last year you said 10 milligrams a day for seven days, so it was 70 milligrams. Okay. That sounds about about right, and if, if we, we said if it, if it and if so, and then because um, the question is, um, if they received the immunosuppression in the last 30 days, and what we had was somebody who received a very low dose of steroids, uh, you know, and weren't on, and, and and that was done. We were trying to figure out what was the significant amount, um, amount dose. So apparently we said 10 milligrams per week. Yes. Want to confirm if you know Yes, when autoimmune disease presents such as diabetes, RA, or... So, um, those can, so the question is, if they have diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, or lupus, are they immunosuppressed because they have that autoimmune disease? It's actually the treatment for those conditions that might, not diabetes particularly, but, and diabetes is, uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes is, in a, is a, in, in, you know, possibly immune mediated. But the answer to that question in short is no. It's actually going to be the, the medications they might receive for the lupus or for the rheumatoid arthritis, things like Remicade, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So a lot of treatments for rheumatoid arthritis, if they're the sort of fancy ones, are going to count as immunosuppression. Same thing for lupus, but not the condition itself. Good question. All right. I'm sorry, quick question going back to liver. So, congestive hepatopathy for like low CHF, yes. sequestration acutely, 
is not going to be a liver disease? You Correct. Know, that's just, okay. Yeah. Now, is it, are you always going to know whether it's acute or not? No. Are you always going to know they don't have cirrhosis? No. You may be actually in the process of making that diagnosis. Okay. Do the best you can. Okay. Um, but, you know, I think, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's going to be hard. I think it's probably what's going to help you if, you're, if it's an acute situation is if somebody does some imaging and they see, and again, what are we going to do as clinicians? We're going to say, wow, these LTs are through the roof. If the LTs come all the way back down to normal and everything seems fine, probably that was acute hepatopathy, and we're going to operate on them, and they're not going to have chronic liver disease. We don't like to operate on people with liver disease, right? So if we think somebody has cirrhosis due to you know, cardiac cirrhosis, we're going to try to figure that out, right? That's what you would do. So we're going to ultrasound them and image their liver, and, we, and we're going to see whether they have cirrhosis. And if they have cirrhosis, we're probably not going to operate on them. So that's, that's sort of the scenario. Okay, peripheral artery disease. So, you know, clinically, actually, you know what, I'm going to reverse myself. I'd say clinically people no longer include peripheral va or cerebral vascular disease in the term peripheral artery disease. I did, but I think mostly people when they say peripheral artery disease do not mean cerebral vascular disease, and I think that's how people use it clinically now. So I, I'm going to I usually point that out. But basically, the FTS does not include cerebral vascular disease uh, either. And so what we mean by um, PAD is uh, disease um, in the other vessels outside the head. And um, basically, it's a kind of they loosened up the diagnosis a few years back to include claudication, amputation for arterial insufficiency, um, if you've had surgery to correct a blocked artery in the periphery, um, if you have a non-invasive test, which is either a 50% diameter or they give you the ankle break, they actually give you a pretty, a pretty loose ankle brachial index. That's not a very severe, you know, stenosis, to be honest. But, um, and then the only other one, which we saw some people who were not coding, you know, somebody had a triple A repair and it didn't fix. So they said they're not coding it. That counts as peripheral arterial disease, as does a prior carotid endarterectomy. That counts as peripheral artery disease. So the fact that it's been fixed, we're really kind of looking at the physiology as a risk factor, yes. Uh, could you go over diabetes amputations? Well, so the, the, your question is what about diabetes uh, amputations? It might possibly be due to small vessel insufficiency rather than but you can have a, a non-healing sort of venous stasis also, also that gets infected or maybe gets osteo. You have to amputate. That's not due to exactly. Often there's concomitant peripheral arterial disease that goes with that. But what it's pointing out is you could have an amputation that's setting in diabetes that's not due to PAD. That's your question, I assume. So that would not be included in this variable. Because it's not the amputation that's the risk factor. What we're trying to get is do they have vascular disease that would make them at you know, risk for bad outcomes. Um, and so now having an actively infected venous stasis ulcer, which is not one of our risk factors, probably is a, is a risk factor. But that said, it's not meant to be included in this. Good question. Questions? Yes. Does diabetic neuropathy get coded as PAD? No. Does diabetic neuropathy get coded as, as PAD? It does not, although I will say they, um, it does not. And actually, I was going to say that sometimes they go together, but I have seen plenty of patients who don't have PAD who do have neuropathy. They can be, they can be separate, um, actually. Uh, yes? Another question. Definition says this does not include carotid disease, but I've heard you say that it was PAD. Yeah. Is that oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead and commented on you're right. I, my, my bad. It does not include carotid disease, but I was talking about treated vascular disease, and I said if you have AAA that's been repaired or uh, iliofemoral bypass, that counts. And then I left the head to cerebral vascular disease and said a carotid endarterectomy would count, but I meant it would count as cerebral vascular disease, not PAD. And so uh, that was a test, and you guys passed, so brilliant. Uh, all right, very good. Yes, no, I, I, I jumped ahead to the next variable. Also a good question. Anything else? Looks like I may have escaped. Cerebral vascular disease. So what I just said about carotid endarterectomy counts. Now here the, uh, they, they have um, 
uh, they count if you've had a prior stroke or TIA. They do not count. Um, uh, they do not count. They, they, they're meeting. They're meeting uh, things that are due to vascular disease. They do not mean. Um, they do not mean uh, in, uh, metabolic encephalopathy, and they do not mean something that's a consequence of a car cardiac arrest which is going to be the normal scenario for anoxic encephalopathy. And, um, the, uh, and they, they, they do mean, though, kind of any kind of stroke. So it can be a hemorrhagic stroke, which is due to a different kind of vascular disease than, say, athero you know, atheromatous kind of a, a stroke. Um, and I think the qu we have been occasionally asked by about, you know, embolic strokes or whatever, but those, generally a stroke is going to count because you don't have a good way to tell that it's embolic in most cases, particularly in somebody who's undergoing a bypass surgery. They have vascular disease, so you're never going to know for sure, even if they're in AFib, that it was embolic. It could still be uh, vascular related. So strokes are going to count in general, even hemorrhagic, but um, encephalopathy that's not due to vascular disease is not going to count. I think we may have had, did we ever get a vasculitis question? I don't remember whether we got a vasculitis question. I wouldn't count um, acute vasculitis, but I cannot imagine we operate on people with cerebral vasculitis hardly ever. If we are, that's a very unusual practice, so that's probably just not going to come up. Uh, prior CVA. Okay, CVA is a separate risk factor itself, and what's important is actually, um, uh, I think we had, yeah, is how recent it was. So. Um, um, this also comes up in trying to determine post-op whether they have had a new stroke, right? This is part of the reason why we pay attention to this, but because you're going to want to know what the symptoms were if they were residual before the surgery. But basically, it's uh, if somebody says they had a stroke, and then it, you just have to say when it was. And here again, we don't have the exact time for that 30 days, but for the longer time intervals, I'd say you know. If, if, you're close, if you're within a day, that's going to be, you know, right? it's going to be the day of surgery um, rather than the minute of surgery that matters. Does that make sense? Um, STS talks about why they have a category for unknown uh, for, this is for TIA. Um, I don't think this pans out as a risk factor particularly, so I'm going to say that's not important. That we also code carotid stenosis separately. This would count as cerebral vascular disease, but we also code, we were looking at this as a risk factor for stroke because that's one of our reported outcomes, and we're, we were looking at this as something that we could risk adjust for the risk of stroke. So this gives you the definition based on any kind of imaging greater than 50%, we'll count that as a carotid stenosis. That's pretty straightforward. And what if they give you words instead of numbers? We tried to translate those, and we translated them as this. Actually, this may be the STS that translated these. I don't remember. We started doing this a long time ago, translating uh, words into uh, numbers, uh, words into numbers. And actually, now the STS, the STS started doing it a little while later. And I, to be completely honest, we try to stick with whatever the when the STS does it, we usually go with what they do. They don't, and I can't remember at this point when it's us and when it's them, uh, but this is, I think this may be them. Um, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily code a stenosis. And, um, well, they could re-image that, that artery and find a, you know, a stenosis, but you would, they, if you, if you had had a quadrant endarterectomy and then they re-image it and it says no stenosis, then there's no or less than 50%, then you're going to just say they don't have. You're not going to code this. So and okay, prior cardiac surgery. That's pretty. That's quadrant endarterectomy. Yes. Have a history of CDD. You would not code that. I, what do you mean as a history of car, uh, cerebral vascular disease? as a stenting, as a stenting. Oh, what about carotid stent? Yeah, so if they, in his case, if this patient had uh, clear, you wouldn't quote it as a stenosis, but you'd still quote it as a stent. 
Uh, so if you'd had a prior carotid stent, right. you'd code yes for cerebral vascular disease, yes. If they did an ultrasound and there was no residual stenosis, you would not code that they had any particular stenosis. Does that make sense? What would you code? What would you code? How would you, which percentage stenosis would you code? No, not the percent. Okay. Below, a history. Yes, history, yes. Right. yes. So that's the yes. That's the yes. Yeah. You'd you code? Prior CVA. Yes, you, they might have had a prior stroke and you'd say they had CVD. Yep. Yes, that's right. You would just not code a specific percentage because that's actually, a, I guess, a child variable. All right. Um, I haven't been asked about creatinine. We just want the creatinine closest to the surgery, basically. Usual range to 12? Um, well, the, um, I think what they mean is what are, what, what, that's a software thing, I'm going to guess. Uh, like what, the software may kick out, I don't know what that, that means, but yeah, that's not normal. They're not saying normal, they're saying creatinine generally fall within the 0.1 to 12 range. But I've seen higher than 12 in people on dialysis. That means, you know, that's, that, I, I'm not sure why they say that. Ignore that. So, and then, and then I think, I believe those are probably, that may be, it may be the software, is, if, you, if you try to enter 50, that, this may mean the software is going to kick it out. I don't know. Do you know the answer to that, anybody? I don't know why we say, you know, we even bother with that. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so this is, the software has sort of checked to make sure you didn't put 99. Oh, okay. If you put 99 in there, it's going to say, no, nobody's creatinine is 99, even if you're on dialysis. And so they're making, I think that's what that's about. Is 12 or 30 normal? No. That's not normal. Yep. And so total albumin. Uh, this has to do, now we're getting into that liver function melt score. These are what these things are about. And this is just a, you know, and they say you can go back six weeks. Uh, and beyond that, you don't, that's not capturing the current state, so they don't, and plus, two reasons would give you ranges to go back. One is if it's too far back, it may have nothing to do with the state of the patient right now. The second thing is we basically, you know, want to give you guys some relief about how far you should have to go back and look. If we said you need to go digging for these things 10 years ago, that would be pretty painful, so. And Billy Rubin. And that gets us into INR, and then for INR, we're going to want to know, um, uh, that's where it's important to know, let's see, what we say, are we, we're no longer collecting Coumadin? Just, just, just one, one, now just one or two variables. Just one variable, all right. It's not that, it's not that, we still have it, it's just, yes. um, is it, did we leave the button in it? Is it just yes or no? Five days, is it five days? Um, okay, so maybe we're... It's later on. It's yeah. later on, okay. So we collect, so obviously we collect INR and then we ask you whether they're on warfarin, okay. Good. Uh, prior bypass surgery, okay, so INR, there we go. Prior bypass surgery and, um, and again, this doesn't include angioplasty, this just includes bypass surgery. Um, and then previous valve does include a percutaneous valve. That's a, that may not seem completely symmetric, but um, my surgeons who tell me when they operate on somebody who's had a previous TAVR, it can be a complete mess. It makes sense for an angioplasty doesn't really affect how hard it is to do a bypass surgery. And then um, uh, this is separate from, and then this is previous PCI, and anything that somebody can put in the tip of a catheter to treat coronary disease counts as a PCI. It doesn't have to be a stent or a balloon. It can be any kind of cutting device, and we're pretty clever about all the little gizmos, lasers, and, you know, uh, lightsabers and things that we put at the tip of a catheter. So any of those things count as a coronary intervention. And um, what else is there to say about that? Um, Multiple PCIs. It's a little confusing. I don't know where you, how you could indicate if somebody has a previous PCI versus multiple cases. Well, we do, that's a good point. We don't, they, so the question was, we're not really capturing if they've had 25 PCIs or if they've had one, and you're right, although we do count the, the, the number of diseased vessels, right. we count ejection fraction, we count, we, so there are other ways that we get the severity of the coronary disease other than how many stents they've had. So, um, but that's a good point. And then, of course, we want to know, 
What, is the surgery being done as a bailout? Again, it's not the cardiologist's fault, but every once in a while something goes wrong with an angioplasty, and that's the reason we're doing the bypass surgery. Those are pretty acute situations. We definitely want to capture that risk, and so it's less than six hours now. This one is going to be fairly important to know the exact time. So now I have to remember um, whether the, is it specified um, out there in the techno land wh where, when we say the, uh, the angioplasty, uh, it is specified. Now the angioplasty ends when, the, when the, the interventional catheter is removed. So when they're pulling out, and that may not be when they leave the cath lab. In fact, it will not be when they leave the cath lab. So I, was, I would be looking for that last stent deployment, and that will be in the log, and that will give you that time. And then remind me for the surgery, it's, it's the cut time. Okay, so this, our three choices were induction of anesthesia into the OR or cut time. For this one, they use cut time, which is, I guess, the way to think about that. That is the latest of those three times. So this is giving you, um, this is actually giving you the smallest chance of actually meeting the less than six hour, well, the, actually it's sort of symmetric. You're giving the latest time you could have for the angioplasty. Instead of the beginning of the angioplasty, they used a later time. So that helps the surgeon get less than six hours. But then at the other end, they're doing the latest possible time that they could have counted the surgery. Anyway, so that's, it's, it's on the late side for both ends of the time interval to get that six hours. Does that make sense? So that might be my mnemonic. It's late and late, so. And you're just going to have to, probably every time you're going to have to look up whether it was the, you know, the cut time anesthesia or enter the OR. And then prior myocardial infarction, and then you're going to get into the time. And then, um, so the myocardial infarction, uh, you're going to say, um, okay, and this was where they used the phrase about when the myocardial infarction was diagnosed. They used the phrase, you should time the myocardial infarction for when it was diagnosed. What is the phrase, when it was diagnosed? Does it mean when did Dr. Steinle finally figure out the person had a myocardial infarction? Or is it when Dr. Steinle thought the myocardial infarction occurred? not when he figured it out. So I might figure out on Tuesday that they had a myocardial infarction on Monday. Does it mean Monday or Tuesday? It means Monday. If I, you know, am clueless but figure out, oh, yeah, that's a and I forgot to check, but it was really 10 yesterday, they had the myocardial infarction yesterday. Um, does that make sense? Even if I only figured it out today. So, um, and then the time that the surgery started for this one, somebody tell me because I have to look it up and it says, uh, when did the surgery start? What? Entry into the OR. So this one is entry into the OR. So, yes? When SFR is done during the test, is it considered a PCI? No. So the, the question is, is when fractional flow reserve is done during a procedure, during an intervention, is that considered a PCI? Now, um, uh, no, it's not. And in fact, in I can think of two scenarios. It's usually going to be pretty obvious, but um, so here, here's the, here, here would be a scenario. You're going to take some, somebody comes in, and the, the cardiologist is going to say, wow, if that LAD, you know, this person's got kind of a lot of coronary disease, but it's mostly in the RCA and the circumflex, but if that thing I'm seeing in the proximal LAD, if that's real, I'm going to send them for bypass surgery because they have bypass surgery, and a study would show prox LAD, three vessel disease, going to do better with bypass surgery. But if that LAD lesion is not real, I'm going to send them. So they do the FFR, it's real. So it diagnoses, it diagnoses the disease in the LAD, they send them for bypass, and let's say they, the patient's unstable, so they do the bypass surgery that same day, they put no stent in. They did not have a PCI within six hours of the procedure. They just had an FFR, which is a diagnostic test. Does that make sense? Yes. Another question. Timing of MI is confusing. Do we look for the component to based on MD documentation? So, um, uh, so that, uh, okay, this is where you're going to use your clinical judgment. So, if the, um, Let's say you have a negative troponin when the patient arrives, 
I'll just tell you two scenarios and see if this makes sense. You, they, they arrived, they had chest pain. Um, well, okay. I can think of multiple scenarios. So um, if they had two hours of chest pain, the first proponent is negative, and the second proponent is 10, their myocardial infarction occurred when the chest pain happened, and it took a few hours for this proponent to rise because the patient showed up right away, okay? Um, and so their myocardial infarction happened when the chest pain was. Now, that may have been the day before. Now, usually if it's the day before, this isn't going to usually matter if this proponent is, is, unless this proponent is positive to begin with. I'll go through a couple scenarios and just do the best I can. So if, if the proponent rises while they're there and the chest pain was a couple hours earlier, the, the myocardial infarction should be timed from a couple hours earlier when the chest pain occurred. Now, if they came in and the proponent was negative, 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 then they had more chest pain in the hospital. And, you don't, and it's kind of documented that the patient had some more chest pain this morning and somebody drew a troponin and then the, the troponin was newly elevated after having been clearly negative when they arrived. And you don't know when chest pain occurs because this is not documented in the nursing note. I would time it from when the, the troponin was drawn, not when it was reported, but when it was drawn. I wish I could make this simpler, but this is the best I can do. Yes? I was going to point out, so um, the CAP PCI, the ACC has definitions for this. Um, and they're very specific as to when the EKG um, was done and it was identified. Um, and they don't, I mean, they do use troponins, um, however. They use when the clinical scenario occurred. Right. Which is what I'm saying. Right. Right. So, so the, you're aligning with the ACC. Uh, which is, and the STS intends, they, they actually they're had those. trying to align Yeah, the NCDR, which is the angioplasty registry, and the STS actually had a big confab where they tried to reconcile right. their in common variables, and they tried to agree with each other. Cardiologists and surgeons, you know, always agreeing with each other. Um, <laughs> and so they mostly, they mostly did. But basically the symptoms tell you when the infarct happens, the troponin lags. Right. But you don't always know. If the only thing you have is that the troponin was normal and then it rose, and you don't know exactly when the chest pain occurred, you're going to use it to when it was drawn. That's about the best you can do. Yeah. Another question. Do you consider echo with hypokinesis, diastasis, or acute and analysis? Only if the clinician said it was a myocardial infarction. So I have had it come up where nobody said the patient had a myocardial infarction. It's not listed anywhere in the chart, but somebody read hypokinesis on the, on the echo. And um, in general, you're going to not make a diagnosis of a myocardial infarction that wasn't made by somebody. Um, and then, um, but then getting more into the timing of the infarct, um, which is what if they show up and they're yeah, I, the, it's a similar scenario to they had chest pain two hours ago, initial component is negative, and, and then the second one is positive. You're going to go two hours earlier to when the chest pain was. If they had chest pain two days ago and the initial component is positive, you're going to say the infarct was two days ago. Now, yeah, and what if they don't tell you exactly when the chest pain is? You just got to do the best you can and say that it was yesterday because they may not tell you the time yesterday. But it mostly it's not going to matter, but it is unfortunately going to probably matter sometimes for that 24 hour when they say, yesterday morning the patient had chest pain, and you're going to say, well, if it was 10 a.m., they make the 24 hours. If it was 11 a.m., they don't. Just do the best you can. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the question was about, what was the question again, the last question? Hypokinesis. Oh, hypokinesis, yeah. And, that, and I won't get into the reasons for that, but I've seen it. Um, I've seen it where, well, okay, so this would be the clinical judgment again where, um, uh, like that, where, you know, we have seen cases where it was really, 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 really obvious that everybody knew the patient had had a myocardial infarction. Troponins were positive, there was a wall motion abnormality, they put the patient on heparin, blah, blah. Nobody used the term myocardial infarction, they just sort of failed to use that term. You know, they said cardiac necrosis or something like that, and, and then we were asked, can I say they had a myocardial infarction? And we said, yes. You know, they just didn't use the word, but it, it's very obvious from reading the chart that everybody thought they had one. What you shouldn't do is make a diagnosis that it appears nobody knew they had. So, all right. And am I getting another question or should I move on? I should move on. Heart failure, I should move on. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, somebody needs to say they had heart failure. 
And then um, they, they, you know, this is actually a variable that I will say they've improved. They've mostly improved this one over the years, and that they've basically been decent about figuring out the time variable. So we, they, they, they now have acute, chronic, or both. And you know, um, acute means that they have symptoms uh, uh, within the last. Um, two weeks that are worse or new, and then um, I think the problem is the, 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 probably the complexity with their current generation of this definition is what if they have heart failure symptoms that are present, but you're a little unclear about whether they've worsened or not in the last two weeks, that are, you know, they have some stable disc beyond exertion. The way I would read this is that um, that would potentially be chronic. They used to say, they used to make the distinction that if you had any symptoms of heart failure, even if they were stable, at the, you know, within two weeks of the surgery, you got to have the two-week thing. But the latest version of this um, basically seems to be trying to get it, has the heart failure worsened? Are they having any exacerbation within the last two weeks, or is it chronic? Um, how are people coding this? I'm just curious, because this is a slight different, slightly different wording. Yes? I think it's like very anesthesiologist evaluations and then they'll check uh, worsening heart failure okay. as part of the indication. Okay. I'm a little worried if that's the only place it is, but if you have, if you have, um, it's also um, corroborated with uh, like an echo yeah. or cat. Yeah, and uh, so good, because I will say the, pro uh, the problem with this is we're not going to be very explicit and say, the heart failure got worse, right? We're gonna, we're, I mean, we, we're, we may, we'll say lots of other things. We'll say this patient has a history of congestive heart failure and presented with shortness of breath. Now, the shortness of breath could be an anginal equivalent or it could be worsening of the heart failure. It's wor probably worsening of the heart failure if it was associated with the need for diuresis, edema, pulmonary edema on the chest x-ray. So there's gonna be, so it's a little bit complicated, but I think, um, I guess, whoops, the point would be though, you're, you're, if they've had no heart failure symptoms I think, you know, if they had no heart failure symptoms at all in the last two weeks, but they have a, you know, history of heart failure in the past, you're going to say chronic. If they have heart failure symptoms now, you're going to try to figure out, okay, is this just what they have all the time and nothing has gotten worse, or is this a worsening? And then you're going to code acute. But the acute people are going to be people who have symptoms now, yes. Uh, one thing we look at is uh, the Lasix increase, mm -hmm. uh, changes in the x-ray and pulmonologist comments which might be able to give you a clue about worsening heart failure. Right. But I think if you have somebody who comes in with chest pain, no shortness of breath on a stable dose of Lasix, and a history of heart failure, that's the easy one where it's chronic. Right. The, the, the hard one are going to be trying to separate. So, but if you have ongoing symptoms now, at least you're in the ballpark that they might have a key, which is what you're trying to get at, yeah. So that's the, that's the, the new one. And I think the last generation of this variable just before this one, that was all the distinction you had to make. Do they have heart failure symptoms now, or do they have a, um, but the, um, although I take it back, they did say something about a worsening in that one. It was just less prominently uh, part of the definition, so. Chronic heart failure develops gradually, and then they give you some information that you don't need to know about, you know, the behavior of heart failure. Any other questions about this one? Yes. Should we look for the word doctor saying heart failure? Uh, so. I don't get that. I get usually before a vowel, which is, might be very bad, mm -hmm. you know, breathing and all that. Um, increase short of breath with exertion. That might be all, but I'll see. Yeah, so, and um, that's a good point. I'm, trying, I'm just thinking about this a little bit. Because um, these people are all going to be getting bypass surgery, so I'm just thinking about it. Is it possible to have an increased shortness of breath due to AS plus, plus coronary disease that is not heart failure? Um, but I don't know that we're going to quibble about this too much. So you're going to want to probably, like, because like, we don't report just isolated AS surgeries. So we're talking about somebody who also has coronary disease. So if they have dysmount exertion and nobody's guy releasing them, nobody is, there's no edema on the chest x-ray, and because what you're going to have is like triple vessel disease plus AS or, you know, significant coronary disease plus AS. And they just have short shortness of breath with exertion, but no orthopnea, no edema, no weight gain, nothing on chest x-ray, 
Uh, if the BMP is 2,000, I'd say heart failure, but if the BMP is you know, only mildly elevated or, or normal, I'd probably say no heart failure, and I'd say that was actually just due to the coronary, because you, you don't have to have heart failure to have shortness of breath due to the combination of CAD and AS, for instance. Does that make sense? But you're what right. About mitral valves? Like well, again, the they're going to have coronary disease plus mitral valve disease, but in the mitral valve situation, you're probably right, it's probably more often heart failure than with the AS situation, but um, so you're going to look for some, something that suggests heart failure, I'd say, rather than the angel equivalent, but you, all you, this is where you can just do the best you can do. So, does that make sense? So, if the, if, so what would make me say, probably not, cold normal BMP, negative chest x-ray, normal ejection fraction, nobody gave diuretic. Then I'd be thinking, yeah, maybe this was shortness of breath. That's not that's not part there. Yes. Okay, I've got a question. Heart failure within two weeks. Heart failure. Uh, no shortness of breath. Two shortness of breath with moderate exertion. Three shortness of breath with minimal exertion. Or four shortness of breath. So that's a question about the severity of the heart failure, New York Heart Association class, I believe, because they're saying, you know, and, and so I guess the, I'm going to interpret that question as, is that the correct coding of class? And so we'll, we'll do that next. Um, uh, maybe you can confirm, whoever wrote that question, maybe you could confirm that I'm interpreting it correctly, because we're about to do class of uh, heart failure right here. and. Um, I have a rule of thumb, which I'll just skip to, because, um, you know, first of all, only heart failure trained cardiologists will actually put the severity of class in, in the chart usually, although actually every time I say that, cardiologists say, no, no, I do it too, and I'm, but anyway, a lot of times we won't, we won't explicitly tell you the class, we'll make you figure it out, it's all a test, but so the, the rule of thumb is that if they have no, if they have heart failure, but they're currently symptomatic or only symptomatic with really vigorous activity, that's a one. If you're symptomatic at rest or symptomatic with very, very minimal activity, so that would be like walking across the room, that's a class four. So those are kind of the anchors on either side, you know, no symptoms or rest. It's in between the two and three that are a little tricky. So here's the rule of thumb. If you, if you people who are class two, um, only some activities cause shortness of breath. So if they pick their activities carefully, they can get through the day without having symptoms. So that means they're not going to necessarily have symptoms every day. They're only going to have symptoms some days. And usually people who are class two might be satisfied with their symptoms unless they're young and really active because they can, they can live their life without having symptoms as long as they're sort of careful about what they do. People who are class three, that means activities of daily living, things you have to do every day, like walk around the house, uh, put on your clothing, uh, uh, walk into the you know, grocery store. These things are going to make you short of breath. You're going to have symptoms every day. People who are class three are often not satisfied with their symptoms, and they're going to have symptoms every day. Now, is the documentation in the, documentation in the chart good enough to make this distinction? Always, because uh, clinicians are excellent at documenting, and they never leave anything out. Um, and uh, uh, actually, no, but, um, but you do the best you can. It turns out class four versus everything else is kind of the important distinction to make. Yes? So she said that you interpreted the question correctly, and somehow heart failure diagnosis is not documented. We review cases the past 30 days, and no way we can go back and get a chart. Would that suffice if no heart failure diagnosis to use the NYHA classification? Example, issue report, progressive DOE, denied CP, syncope history, severe AD stenosis, last echo in August 2016. AD is and shows calcified degeneration, CW stenosis. Hi, so let's see. Nobody used the word heart failure, but we reviewed the past 30 days in the chart. We can't go back further, I guess, is right now. Would it survive, suffice if we, if, if somebody, if we use the New York Heart Association classification? Does that mean that a clinician mentioned the New York Heart Association classification? I guess I've asked you. Whoever's asking that question, 
if you if, did, the, did somebody put in the card association classification in the chart? And then the example says the patient reports progressive dysmount exertion without chest discomfort. They have severe aortic stenosis, and they give you the parameters for the aortic stenosis, and and it's a normal ejection fraction. And, and now remember again, the patient's going to have coronary disease because we're not really talking about uh, isolated valve disease. So I guess that comes back to. If you have severe AS and coronary disease, is progressive dyspnea on exertion always due to heart failure? And I don't know whether the, the clinician mentioned New York Heart Association class or not. That's, that gets back to my prior answer, which is sometimes it's going to be due to um, heart failure and sometimes it isn't. Now, that's a case where the ejection fraction is normal. So I would say if there's no orthopnea, no PND, uh, again, severe coronary disease, nobody treated with diuretic, normal BMP, I probably wouldn't, I would not call that heart failure. I'd say that's symptomatic AS and coronary disease, yes. And she's subject to NYHA too. Okay, got it. Now I understand the question. Clinicians use the New York Heart Association class as a global measure of functional status. They don't necessarily mean only due to heart failure. Now the STS has vacillated on this issue. Currently, New York Heart Association class is meant to refer to symptoms due to heart failure, not to global functional status. Is it impossible to tell the difference in some patients? Yes. Like if you have class three angina and class two heart failure, do I have any way, since you have both heart failure and angina, do I have any way to know that it's the, it's the angina that's making you have class three symptoms, I have no way to know that. So I'm gonna say you have new class three heart failure. But if somebody says, I have a patient who has no heart failure whatsoever, who has angina and valve disease manifest by shortness of breath, and they're class two, that's class two angina, it's not class two heart failure. So you would not code the, either heart failure, or actually for the STS, you wouldn't code the New York Heart Association class. So that may be the thing I failed to mention is New York Heart Association class for this context only applies to symptoms due to heart failure. It's not meant to be a measure of angina, even though in clinical practice it is meant to be a measure of angina and we use it that way. So, and what, and so maybe you could type to Denise whether I, got to, whether I answered your question and I'm gonna move on, but if I, if it, if I wasn't clear, let me know. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just want to clarify earlier talking about when we can code heart failure, yes. where the doctor doesn't say heart failure. But, yes. but then you say, look at when you take a diabetes, pulmonary thing. Aren't we making the diabetes well, that can be code yet? So I think I'm making a distinction between when I don't want you to make a diagnosis that appears to have been unrecognized by the clinician. But I can't remove the clinical judgment because sometimes we will not use it. Like they may, so for instance, they may have said this patient presented with a. So sometimes we use the term cardiogenic shock. Do patients with cardiogenic shock have heart failure? Pretty much 100% of the time they do. So we may not use the term heart failure. So, but, um, so they may. So they may say this present. This patient presented with um, uh, an acute myocardial infarction complicated by pulmonary edema. We gave them links, et cetera. They may never use the term heart failure. You're, but they, you, you read the chart, you, they use some synonym, or they, you're pretty sure, you can tell they knew the patient had heart failure because they treated it and there were objective findings for heart failure. So you're not making a diagnosis, you're basically just recognizing that they made the diagnosis without explicitly using the words. Does that make sense? So I guess that's the way I put it. If, if in your clinical judgment, it's obvious they made the diagnosis, but they don't write the exact synonym that we talked about, um, and they treated it, and it's obvious to you the patient had it, then you can say, yeah, they had heart failure, we just didn't use those words. Usually there will be some synonym, but we don't always, you know, our documentation can be, I've, I've been a little facetious, but it can be pretty sparse at times. So we might say the patient presented with pulmonary edema on chest x-ray, acute myocardial infarction, their ejection fraction was reduced, we gave them Lasix, we gave them dilator, we made it, and, we, and failed to mention they had heart failure. Okay. And then the follow-up question yes. to using uh, documentation of the NYHA, but only 
as in like our documentation, the cardiologists um, on their preliminary cardiology graph report will have this stuff. Uh, yes. And the GDO asks them to throw it out. And then they circle. Got it, got it, got it, got it. I see what you're saying. So um, that's true. The NCDR does actually ask you to put the year of our association class. And in that application, I, I believe they don't necessarily mean heart failure. They mean just global. So we can't, you, if they act, circle MIHA, we can't assume that they're saying this patient has this yes. Uh, I'm going to, you know what, can we clarify how the end, now, well, yes, I would say you can't assume that. I'm not 100% sure. That the end, uh, what the NTBR is doing with that one at this moment, we can look it up. But let me put it this way: even if the NTBR is telling people that they should use that for only heart failure, it's possible that they'll miscode it, and they'll just say this person has class two angina. So if you read the chart and all the stuff I said before, you know, no diuretic, normal EF, angina, neocarditation class two, you just see no signs of heart failure. Nobody says they have heart failure. That's probably referring to angina. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Just one thing for that NCDR, if there's angina classification and there's there's NYHA. There's CCS one, two, three, four. So they so they are meant to use NYHA only for heart failure? Yeah. That's yeah. helpful. That's helpful. Okay. So um, Dr. Matson is pointing out that what they're meant to be doing is using NYHA for heart failure. However, this is where clinical judges, but they could make mistakes because, you know, so I, they're supposed to use the CCS class for angina. They're supposed to be using one for the other and, and so forth. However, they may not do that. So if you, if you, if it's the only documentation you have is an NYH class and everything else tells you, boy, this person doesn't appear to have heart failure, it seems like angina, I wouldn't code it. Um, but does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I've got a question for another hospital. Yes. Do we code NYHA4 if on HMP the patient admits SOB at rest and then the PA rests NYHA2? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, so again, we were talking about these. So, what? Use a three. Yeah, three. I, the answer. So, um, here again, it's going to be. So let me let's, let me. So NYHA class changes, you know, minute by minute, but it's meant to be the highest class in the last two weeks. So if they presented with pulmonary edema and chest X-ray and shortness of breath at rest, I would say you would code NYHA4. If, on the other hand, they present with a myocardial infarction, some chest pain and shortness of breath at rest, they weren't in pulmonary edema, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then I would have, I would have said it's probably angina at rest. So I would have, I would say no, but are you really going to be able to tell the difference reliably? Probably not. So this would be one: do the best you can. But it's, you know, this is the problem with uh, uh, trying to separate the cause and the symptoms. So I think the, the short answer to that is possibly yes. That would be the short answer, unless you have really good reason to believe that this shortness of breath at rest was for sure angina. Okay.